Uh, I'm Dr. Abdul Singh, I'm, uh, and uh, it is a great pleasure for me to give this talk. And um, I also thank the organizers, uh, Dr. Bansi and the whole group, uh, whom I consider as as a very close friend of mine. And uh, so it's a it's a real pleasure to give this talk to you on gestational diabetes challenges, diagnosis, and management. And this is something that I'm not giving a talk. This is something that lies very lies very close to my heart. Because unless we can control the gestation diabetes, we will not be able to control diabetes and as a whole and from the idea perspective. So therefore, it is it's becoming more and more important. And you can see that, for example, you see that global there is a global increase in prevalence of diabetes, as we know. But this global uh, uh, increase in diabetes, prevalence of diabetes is not without a global increase in gestation diabetes. And if you look at the individual importance, hyperglycemia in pregnancy has adverse effect in both mother and the fetus. And it has also a kind of huge public health importance. And it should, and as we, as we have discussed, that when to start more complete, that, that we should start the prevention of type 2 diabetes since the inception, that is, uh, that is in, in the gestation. And we also know that uh, that the effects of our pregnancy that it will increase the production of the cortisol, cholesterol, pro progesterone, etc., and this will also increase the insulin resistance, and which is which is uh, the big issue. The lipolysis will increase. The mothers use the fat fat for her calorie requirement and save glucose for fetal needs. And fetus uses alanoli um, and other amino acids, and they deprive the mothers of a major Gluco, uh, um, uh, um, gluconeogenesis, uh, and um, and then glucose metabolism in pregnancy, and actually what is actually what is uh, actually affecting in early pregnancy, we know that we know that uh, there's uh, that uh, PRL, the prolactin, stimulates the beta cell uh, insulin and sensitivity, and uh, same and. In, uh, glucose utilization of 10% falling blood glucose level. In late pregnancy, there is a number of consequences in the same way that we see the fetal placenta until the extracts of the glucose and insulin sensitivity decreases progressively up to 50 to 80%. And it variety of hormones secreted by the placenta, especially HPL and placental growth of hormones variant cortisols. So what is GDN? So, so in a sense, that it brings us to the to the last question. That actually, what is GDN? The glucose intolerance recognized for the first time in, during pregnancy, brought out by the insulin resistance, normal pregnancy, or demand on the beta cells, whatever the reasons may be. And and this this definition actually doesn't uh, it doesn't exclude the women with pre-existing diabetes previously undiagnosed. And this is one of the major issues that we continuously discuss that how to differentiate between those two. And the undiagnosed type two diabetes with a higher A1C have risk for major malformation. And most women diagnosed before 24 weeks have a pre-diabetes or frank of type two diabetes. So you see that we need to we need to when we are thinking of the glucose intolerance recognized in the first trimester during this pregnancy, and and um, uh, uh, during the time of pregnancy that 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 we should be uh, then we should be able to distinguish those who had a kind of who had a uh, diabetes a frank diabetes uh, diabetes before the conception before they became pregnant. So this brings up to the discussions that we have a kind of pre-gestational diabetes and gestational diabetes. And in that means in, in pregnancy, in pre-existing, it can be both in type 1 and type 2 and gestational diabetes, the diabetes diagnosed in pregnancy, where the diabetes was not present before the pregnancy. So diabetes in pregnancy brings us to, this, uh, to the discussion of pre-existing diabetes and gestational diabetes. And is uh, is um, is a type one and a type two and the pre-existing diabetes and true GDM. So if you see that these categories, so whenever we are thinking of uh, of all these categories, then we need to concentrate on the true GDM cases if we want to see. But until now, there is a major um, there is there are many many confusions, and we try to we try to include everything. If, uh, that is with the pre-existing diabetes and gestational diabetes, and then we need to we need to be careful, and we need to concentrate on these two GDM cases. 
The global magnitude of uh, diabetes, as we know, that it varies also by ethnicity. And this is one of the most important things that we must, we must concentrate, that the risk of GDM, risk of diabetes, is not the same in all population. And therefore, we need to have a specific measures and also a specific diagnostic criteria, I believe, by ethnicity. As for example, we see that uh, we South Asians, we will have 8 to 9 percent, but you know that we have a number of studies from India that it goes all the way up to 18 percent. You see that that's a, that's a huge, huge difference. And the bigger portions, which I'm going to show you later, that which diagnostic criteria we are actually using. And uh, but if you look at, for example, China's uh, Chinese and Japanese is about three <coughs> percent. What is the clinical si uh, significance? The clinical si significance is is uh, the diabetes mellitus and GDM detect during pregnancy are at greater risk for adverse pregnancy outcomes, including macrosomia, eclampsia, hypertensive disorder in pregnancy, and sh uh, uh, shoulder dystalsia. So these are the major complications that we are th we are thinking of. So we have we have major things that whenever we do any kind of intervention, then we can see that whether we can we can actually reduce this this kind of outcomes, and that should be that which definition we should say that which definition or which diagnostic criteria and which treatment procedure actually gives the best outcomes, and that should be our guiding principle. Not that it has been it has been published in the uh, some guidelines are published in the best journals so that should be our guiding criteria our guiding criteria should be that what is for which diagnostic criteria and which treatment criteria gives us the best outcomes so if i if when i'm coming there this question that what is the challenges what are the challenges that we face we see that we we started with this that the thrift phenotype uh, which is barker which is proposed in 1992 we know that it's poor nutrition in early life and that that big gives right to, uh, rise to the to the changes in gene expression and catch, and then we follow up with the catch up growth and the metabolic syndrome and and but we also say this for example the updated hypothesis was on overnutrition overnutrition was also so both the undernutrition and the overnutrition will have an effect in the changes in gene expression and that it this is going to affect and then this is the low birth weight as you said that I will also come to the point of low birth weight that what we think this will uh, these changes in the genetic expression will also have an effect on the environmental stimuli and which results in metabolic syndrome and eventually diabetes so if you look at this picture if you look at this picture carefully this is the the different uh, the difference in the body size fetus development and metabolic control if you look these are the indian mothers that were here and this is a finnish woman do you think that this this birth weight, the different uh, this uh, this uh, this weight gain in pregnancy is similar to this woman compared to this this woman? It can, so we have to see carefully that what is what is actually the guiding principle because we are we seem to believe that we should have one guideline that is for example for 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 the weight gain during uh, during. Uh, during pregnancy and uh, and uh, a similar birth weight irrespective of population which is not the case and we need to we need to see the reality this um, uh, that our colleague from india um, uh, as you, um, uh, you know all this became very famous that the so-called the indian thin fat baby versus white caucasians we know that we are small we have a kind of body fat percentages which is my, my, much higher than the Caucasians, even though we are smaller in size. And this this thing that this uh, this discussion that came up, this is this is actually bringing us a lot of lot of insight into this issue. These are the these are the studies done in the UK. For example, you see the South Asian, a, a, Asian origins. For example, these are the Pakistanis. These are the Indian. These are the Bangladeshis. These three group of uh, mother, uh, children that were born in, in England. So that means that they are not they are not deprived of any kind of they are not deprived of any kind of any kind of nutritional deficiencies or medical treatment. They were given the same kind of treatment as the the British native population. But you see that the the children the bar uh, the uh, birth weight of the of the Asian children born in UK is continuously lower than. Should we say that all the children that that is of from Indian subcontinent born in UK are sick? It is not, and therefore we need to adjust. We need to readjust the the discussion on birth weight. 
As we, with this picture also was very famous that we have seen uh, previously, which was uh, that our colleague from India and and a colleague from UK, for example, you said they have an identical BMI, but they have a kind of very different body fat percentages, which is also um, uh, Professor Yasnik has already shown in the in her in his thin fat, and it's also Professor Yasnik that in his young life that is uh, that is the picture. So you see that this is this this brings us to the discussions that what should be the what should be the weight gain during pregnancy, and what should be the ideal birth weight for uh, for the Indian. Uh, babies. We have also recently published on paper on on uh, in this uh, by supplementing uh, during pregnancy vitamin D, uh, D3 and B12. We didn't see any effect in terms of changing in their in the um, uh, baby's body weight. And actually, the birth weight had no uh, association. We didn't find any association with the so-called cardiometabolic risk factors. So, so that means that it is not that birth weight doesn't happen. I'm not. I'm not postulating that there is no effect. That is what that what I'm not. But we are saying that we are grossly misclassifying. We are misclassifying the people, the children who are healthy compared to the children who are sick, and therefore we do not see any any effect because the effect is being diluted. So what are the risk factors? The the history of macrosomia uh, that is there. The race. Um, uh, the polycystic ovarian syndrome, essentially hypertension history of spontaneous abortions previously, obesity, age older than 25 years and persistent glucosuria. So there is a risk factors, but, but you see that these, these risk factors are very common and these are, these, are, these are real risk factors. But I think that we also need to adjust to see that whether there is a difference by ethnicity. Because we see that non, no known risk factor is in 50% of the GDM cases. So you see that even though we try to say that we know the risk factors, but we see that about 50% of these of the of the mothers with GDM do not have any kind of uh, uh, risk factors. We have also seen this. This is a kind of diabetes risk profile in the in the South Asians versus the white Caucasians. You see that there is there is an early onset, late onset with the white uh, you know, with the white Caucasians, low birth weight, normal to high, central obesity, high BMI have body fat percentages, they do not have increased insulin resistance, actually they have lower insulin resistance. So you see that whole lot of differences in risk profile between the South Asians and the white Caucasians. So now comes the question of screening and diagnosis. So if you look at this diagnosis, we have many diagnostic criteria today. And actually we, are, we have so many diagnostic criteria, uh, but unfortunately there is no agreement on this. The WHO has this 1999 criteria, the glucose load of 75 glucose, GDM diagnosed if the plasma glucose is 140 milligram or, for example, or above two hour blood glucose or above two hours after the blood glucose load. In 2013, they changed and dropped its own 1999 criteria and accepted the IDAP SG criteria. So that's a, that's a big change from IDF, uh, sorry, WHO from, from 1999 to 2013. So if you look at this now WHO diagnostic criteria, that GDM now says that should be diagnosed at any time in pregnancy if one or more of the following criteria is set. But you know that as I have discussed before, this doesn't give us the uh, opportunity to differentiate between those who had a diabetes previously. And this is the one hour plasma glucose. Uh, as you know, that I do not have to go into details that one hour plasma, two hour plasma glucose. And in some cases, we also take three hours plasma glucose. Diabetes uh, mellitus in pregnancy should be diagnosed if one of the more following criteria are met fasting blood glucose, two hour plas um, uh, uh, plasma glucose, and random plasma glucose. But random plasma glucose at the moment is, is the same as two hour plasma glucose balance. But uh, I think that in my in my personal opinion that we should try to avoid the random plasma glucose because we do not know that what the random actually con uh, includes. WHO currently does not have a kind of recommendation on whether or how to screen GDM or screening strategies for GDM are considered a priority area in research, particularly in the low and middle income countries. And diabetes mellitus in pregnancy differs from the GDM in that uh, the hyperglycemia is more severe and does not resolve the after pregnancy as it does with GDM. So, so you see that um, hyperglycemia is another another problem, and and uh, 
portion is that uh, portion is that that uh, that that whether it resolves after after the after the after when the pregnancy is over or it exists. Now it comes to this idea of um, IADPSG guidelines, the screening for all for all GDM cases. So that is performed at 24 to 20 weeks of gestation, 75 um, gram of two hour OGTD is used, GDM is diagnosed if the plasma values is fasting, one hour and two hour. So they are, they are taking three measures of fasting, one hour and two hours. So, ADA guidelines for GDM, so it's, uh, it's a fasting, one hour, two hour, and three hours. So you see that we have now four. So you see that there are, there are so, many, so many guidelines now, and, and home and going to screen the Indian scenario, the DIPSI guidelines. So as you know that in India, you have your DIPSI guideline, where you are giving a 75 gram, you are the post um, uh, uh, glucose two hours, and this uh, is the if it is more than 140 milligram per deciliter, is GDM. But you made a cri criteria of in between, and then if it is if it is higher than that, then it should be diabetes. So it's a kind of gross uh, understanding, and which is which is actually better that in in one way, even though you have only one screening, you should be able to distinguish between those two theoretically those who have who have the diabetes previously and those who developed the diabetes during pregnancy the, if you look at this magnitude of the problem of the india you know that this is a, this is a huge there are many studies done in the, in the chennai where many of my friends um, professor mohan and the, his group has worked a lot and as we know that it is uh, is 15 percent 80 about 19 percent so we can say grossly we say that it is more than yeah 15 percent and above probably in india and i will show you that this figure is not very different compared to what we observe in bangladesh but what are the challenges that this variability of two-hour blood glucose differs uh the differing results in 25 percent of the women if are more performed at different times and you see that this allows the, the, the variability, variability of the OGT measures. It's a one step testing may um, result in more false positive cases. And that's, that is one of the things that we should be careful to avoid the false positivity. And then, then the pooled meta analysis of five randomized clinical trials of GDM resulted in birth weight differences of less than 150 grams resulted in 6% risk reduction of low LGA, low for gestation, um, uh, um, uh, gestation age, and may increase the caesarean section. So there are there a are number of issues that we see that this is, uh, if we look at carefully, um, and it seems that it's actually, I will show you that the obesity contributes more to the large for the gestation um, age compared to the GDM. And in that case, treating milder GDM may not have any effect. And that is one of the things that we need to look at carefully. But what is costing us? What is costing us? If we follow the AD criteria with four, with four guidelines, with four uh, testing, it is uh, projected uh, that it will have about three, 636 million to $2 billion per year, the extra cost. This is a study from Bangladesh. We see that we, as we say that, for example, the age specific prevalence of GDM in Bangladesh that we have done, that if you look at this, this idea PSG criteria, then we'll have a kind of overall, uh, overall uh, criteria, overall prevalence of 19%. If we uh, apply ADA criteria, then we have a prevalence of nine, around 9%. 9 if we have a WHO criteria, we have a prevalence of 8%. If we use the DIPSI criteria, then we have about seven percent. So you see that huge difference increases of in IAPD SG criteria. That is, in all others are between seven, eight, nine, but this one is bringing us to more than nineteen percent. And question is that this is not only a diagnostic criteria; this the patient have a consequence, and it costs to the society and to the individuals. But what is its benefit? Medical and nutrition therapy goals that it is to achieve the normal glycemia, the prevent ketosis, secure adequate weight gain, and management of fetal well-being. As I said, that adequate weight gain is a, is a matter of discussion. 
and uh, management of fetal well-being, the secured nutrition supplement with required calories and distribution, regulate carbo um, um, carbohydrate intake and interval of meals. And you say that this is the guidelines for gestational weight gain that we see that the BMI, if you have a BMI of less than this, then for example, recommended range of total weight gain and recommended range of total weight gain in pounds. This is kilogram and it's in pounds. But if you see, look at this, for example, this is also the study from Bangladesh. We see that, for example, those who had a BMI of, so they had, they actually have an increase of 13 to 18 kgs. Those who had higher um, BMI at the outset had only gained only five to nine kgs, 11 to 16 kgs. So if we go to the previous uh, line that you see that, for example, that they, they, none of them are, are, actually, the, are actually coming up. Uh, only, only the, those BMI that was was lower BMI, they are fulfilling the criteria. They have reached the recommended uh, criteria between um, these 13 to 18 kgs. But, but we, but we did not see any differences when we looked at this. For example, the birth weight that there is no difference in terms of the weight gain and the birth weight of the babies. Or, for example, that what is the initial BMI of the mothers? That whether they had a difference initial BMI. Uh, that we uh, that the paper that I've just described that we, we didn't see any differences either with the initial BMI of the mothers or with the changes in the body weight in terms of the baby's birth weight. And gestation weight gain contributes more to the LGS and the overweight and GDM as we have discussed before. This is studies that we see that if we are thinking of if we are thinking of the weight gain, um, for example, large for the gestation age. But you see that, for example, it, but it also differs by race. You see that, for example, this is GDM, this is GDM, this is excessive uh, gain uh, weight, and B, and this is BMI more than twenty five. So if in the white population, if you have, you have, <coughs> if you have, and this is uh, the if you have a BMI of more than twenty five, then you see that this is. Uh, this is the GDM cases. If you look at the GDM cases, it's on the on the red, which is the lowest. It's, it's contributing the lowest. <coughs> so, so my, but compared compared to the BMI, is BMI seems to contribute much more than the than the GDM. Then it brings us to the management issues and challenges. That if you see this need for optimal glycemic control in pregnancy in pre-existing diabetes. You see that encourage patients uh, to use this for self-monitored blood glucose and postprandially, and this is the fasting plasma glucose, less than fine parts, one hour plasma glucose and two hour plasma glucose. That why it should be. This is this is the uh, this is this is the recommended values, but uh, but we probably we we should we should also see this uh, in terms of that what actually is giving us the best result in terms of the complications that we have described previously. The management issues will include the patient education, medical nutrition therapy, pharmacological therapy, glycemic monitoring, the, um, uh, and fetal monitoring, planning on delivery. So what is the goals that achieve normal glycemia, prevent ketosis, provide adequate weight gain, contribute to the fetal weight gain? So as we have said that nutrition, so we can, we can say that what is the goal of this, um, of this uh, the medical therapy and what is the goal for this nutritional plan? We see that metformin and sulfonylurea or uh, glyburide uh, is the two most commonly prescribed oral antihyperglycemic uh, agent during pregnancy. And we see that this has been is increasingly used, but do not, uh, due to the efficacy and safety concerns, AD and DIPSID does not recommend antihyperglycemic agents for gestation diabetes as, as here. But we see that there are more and more, um, I, will, I will come back, we see that more and more people actually uh, globally is actually using this metformin and sulfonylurea. And actually we, that we see that actually this, is, this seems to be quite effective and doesn't actually result in any harm so far in terms of the side effects. The management of uh, management post uh, postpartum, the four patients in uh, pregestational diabetes have blood glucose insulin continues to check blood glucose immediately in postpartum period. So it's important that we check the blood glucose in postpartum. For GDM patients who require insulin therapy, 
They check fasting and postprandial blood glucose, sugars, and treat with insulin if it is necessary. For GDM patients who are diet controlled GDM1, no further monitoring therapy is necessary. So you see that if you can, and, and we also see that, for example, the people, the patients who are treated with insulin in GDM seems to have a higher conversion rate to diabetes. But this, this I must be careful because this is not yet uh, well documented. There are few studies are showing, showing this response. The pharmaceutical management is over the past 30 years, insulin has been used as the medical treatment of gestation diabetes as the first choice of medication. ADA recommends insulin treatment for GDM. However, the use of, as I said, that oral hyperglycemic agents increased in recent year, 10 to 20 years. Metformin and glibenclamide are evaluated for insulin alternatives. In metformin treated studies, equivalent pregnancy outcomes were shown, such as decreased weight gain, and maternal hyperglycemia, these are the studies. However, there is no long-term clinical data in the offspring exposed to oral medication in the parental period. So then this we need to do that, what is the long-term consequences? And the final management in managing GDM patients and the individu uh, individualized medical approach is essential. And in maternal glucose levels have insulin, increased insulin can be used to achieve glycemic targets, insulin metformin, and no intervention agreement on the diagnosis guidelines for the management of GDM cases. As I've said, that there is no international agreement. And this is something that I, on behalf of the IDF, would like to take an initiative to see that whether this is possible to come to an uh, international agreement. But having said it, I think it is more important for us to think that even though there is an international agreement, the international agreement should be based on that, that different population needs different guidelines. Postpartum screening for diagnosis of diabetes is essential for women to prevail, uh, with previous GDM. So that is important that we should follow them up. I think I think I will. Uh, I think we have already man uh, talked about this. I'm sorry that I'm putting the slides. The time is running out. Uh, so therefore, I think that we we should come to the last questions. That what is the questions needs to be asked? That how can we select an old ratio? That's the risk in the absence of a true threshold. In the data, that's a big question for the scientists to think about it. But how can we set up a false ratio threshold? What is the false positive rate using the threshold for the diagnosis? For example, what about the threshold that we agree that what is the risk for false positive cases? And this needs to be discussed and this needs to be answered. What is the impact of patient in um, and workload of increasing the prevalence of the GDM? That what is what would be its impact? If we say that, okay, we, we go from, for example, three, uh, three uh, screening to four screening criteria, and we increase the number of people with GDM diagnosed, <clears throat> what is its impact? Do we have sufficient evidence with respect to treatment benefit at all various thresholds to make an informed decision? This is, these are the things that I would like to discuss with my colleagues that are in order to develop the new guidelines that I'm, I'm hoping for. In the absence of clear benefit, should the diagnostic criteria be changed from 2008? Controversies about the gestation diabetes. There is debate about several aspects of GDM diagnosis, including the number of grams of glucose to administer. Controversies in GDM testing include one-step versus two-step testing. <coughs> As you know, the Carpenter and Kalstein uh, criteria versus the national diabetes gui uh, guidelines. Number of times to measure blood glucose in the OGTT specified threshold values for diagnosis and the number of measurements uh, needed to determine the abnormal results. There is no disagree uh, disagreements about screening approaches, whether screening should be selective or universal. Sorry. I think I, my, my apologies, I said that I should be saying there is no agreement, not disagreement about the screening approaches because there are two approaches that one is saying that we should have universal screening, the other one is selective, um, selective screening based on the high risk individual. Discrepancies even exist over how to label the condition of pregnancy associated hyperglycemia. This is, these are the controversies that we need to discuss. These are the things that I'm going to ask my colleagues to address 
in, a, in our eventual new guideline. This agreement also exists for the treatment approaches. And this is, a, this is one paper, this is the American College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists. They are saying there is no evidence that the identification and treatment of women based on the new International Association of Diabetes Pregnancy Study Group recommends will lead to clinically significant improvement in maternal and the neonatal outcomes. And it would lead to significant increase in healthcare costs. As I've shown that in Bangladesh, the prevalence of with, uh, with, this, with this criteria would be around more than 19% whereas with following all other diagnostic criteria, it would be around 9%. So final considerations, the international consensus has not been reached for screening diagnosis in which clinical laboratory testing plays a critical role. New regional and international data are required to reach an agreement with possible differences by ethnic-based guidelines. Cuban guidelines, which I have not discussed here, differs in many ways for GDM, but satisfactory with national rates similar to those elsewhere in the Americans. Americas are for preeclampsia, 5%, preterm delivery, 12%, congenital anomalies, 4.3%, 4 and prenatal death, about 4.8%. So it's more or less similar that we see in Cuba. Thus, Cuban criteria differs, but there is no evidence that other guidelines could do any better than the Cubans. So this, with these things that I would like to say, I have given you as a, as a colleague, as, as, a, as a friend, I've given you some thoughts. I believe that India is strong enough to take this message. I, India is strong enough to do their own research and come up with a, with a guideline that would be more acceptable for the people with India or not only India, but the Indian subcontinent for, for, uh, for the diagnosis for the pregnancy weight gain, for the birth weight, and also treatment procedures. Thank you.